Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may be joining from. And for all the Nepali diaspora community joining in, namaste. Welcome to our first session on the global series discussion on global COVID-19 vaccine apartheid focusing on Nepal today. Uh, my name is Arati Maleku, and I am an assistant professor at the College of Social Work at Ohio State University. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the land where this event is being hosted and where I'm speaking from is the ancestral and contemporary lands of indigenous peoples who have stewarded this land for generations. I honor the people who have stewarded this land and acknowledge the role I have for the work for social, economic, and environmental justice. This program is being organized in collaboration with the Ohio State University College of Social Work, the Anhold Institute for Global Health at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai, the Elmhurst Global Health Institute, and Nepal Rising. On behalf of the College of Social Work and the Ohio State University, I would like to thank our collaborating institutions and partners and our invited panelists joining both from the US and Nepal today. I'd like to especially thank our Dean, Tom, Dr. Tom Gregoire, our Chief Diversity Officer, Dr. Jerry Kagotho, Dr. Duncan Maru at Mount Sinai, and our Advocacy Director, Steve David, who will be moderating the session today. Without the efforts of these individuals, this initiative would not have come to fruition. So just to set the context for this event, um, we are 15 months into the pandemic. High income countries like the United States have made great strides in vaccine access and distribution. Most of us here in the US have been privileged to be fully vaccinated. With a significant amount of the American people now vaccinated, the pandemic is slowly coming under control in the US. But the virus does not recognize borders and no one is safe until we all are. While economic developed nations have vaccinated one person every second over the last month, most of the resource poor countries are yet to give a single dose. So these unique vulnerabilities that's born out of vaccine inequities have been referred to as vaccine apartheid, consequences of which are playing out heart-wrenchingly in many resource poor countries like Nepal, which are fully reliant on other countries for vaccines and also become invisible in the process. Our panelists will definitely enlighten us with the realities from the ground, but just to hit some key highlights, currently the positivity rate in Nepal is hovering at 40%, which is the highest in the world. As of today, only 2.4% of the entire 30 million Nepali population is fully vaccinated. Over 1.7 million Nepalis, most of whom are 65 years and above, are still awaiting their second dose of the AstraZeneca vaccine. And until those individuals gather a second dose, Nepal is unwittingly in the middle of a large scale epidemiologic experiment. It is possible that escape variants will be produced and bred into deadly new strains from a large population of incompletely vaccinated people. So the United States is uniquely positioned to prevent further catastrophe in Nepal and end the vaccine apartheid across the globe. The Nepali diaspora community in the US with organizations like Nepal Rising have been leading the charge to raise our voices against vaccine inequity and advocate to the US government to prioritize Nepal for immediate bilateral vaccines. Ending the global vaccine apartheid requires a political commitment and it also requires for all of us to be better advocates. The Nepali diaspora community and Friends of Nepal have been consistently engaging in advocacy efforts, calling their elected officials, petitioning the White House, writing letters to the US State Department, engaging with the Foreign Relations Committee, Subcommittee for South Asia, and we still have to do more. If we do not end the global vaccine apartheid, there will be many more humanitarian catastrophes across the globe. And what happens to COVID-19 globally will fundamentally affect human rights, health and economic interests in the US and across the globe. Just recently, the Director General of the World Health Organization warned that the world has reached the era of COVID-19 vaccine apartheid and sharing the vaccines is the only solution. The Biden-Harris administration has committed 80 million doses of vaccines in the US to be shared with the world which is definitely promising. And just yesterday, you might have heard 
the administration announced to provide 75% of the first 25 million doses of vaccine through the global vaccine facility called COVAX. Um, while COVAX will certainly be an essential player, there is a specific need in Nepal's case for direct and immediate bilateral vaccine support from the US. What is important to point here is that Nepal has suffered a major setback due to COVAX delays and exclusive vaccine reliance from India, which will unlikely to be fulfilled in the near future due to the crisis in India itself. And this will leave Nepal without a reliable source. So the remaining 25% of the first 25 million has been announced to be shared through bilateral mechanisms, um, 70 million of which will be shared with the Southeast Asian and South Asian regions, which now includes 16 Asian countries with an approximate population of 2 billion. Um, while we are assuming that there'll be more information um, forthcoming on how many doses will be sent to Nepal, the catastrophic surge in Nepal warrants more immediate um, bilateral vaccine support. So we need to really shift our gears uh, towards advocacy for bilateral vaccines. Ending this pandemic will take a global effort. And in the spirit of global advocacy, we will now shift our gears to our um, panel discussion. And I'll hand this over to us, our um, advocacy director, Steve, who will um, moderate our session today. On to you, Steve. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Maleku. Um, and for all of your advocacy, you know, the, um, I'm admittedly not an expert in global health policy, but I was brought into this because we really want to have an advocacy focus with this. And um, we have some, some really excellent uh, guests with us today to, to talk about their work on the ground and, um, and tell us what we can do um, to really um, center, uh, center voices of people who are doing the work most directly um, and uplift um, the, the demands that need to happen right now. Um, so I'm going to provide a, um, a brief introduction uh, to our speakers today, and then, um, then I'll, I'll be asking them a couple questions about their work and how we can get engaged with this. Uh, so first, we have Ms. Um, uh, Benita Adhikari. Uh, Benita is a, a public health professional with a nursing background, who's also the executive director of the Health Foundation of Nepal, uh, which is a nonprofit that is implementing community health projects, including COVID-19 response projects in Western Nepal. Um, she has a deep interest in strengthening public health organizations, public health training, um, with an emphasis on mental health and has um, done this work in places like Nepal, India, Liberia, Zambia, and Kenya. Uh, Benita, so glad to have you here with us today. Thank you so much, Steve. <laughs> um, Benita is, uh, is, um, is talking to us from Nepal today um, and so has, uh, um, is, is really rooted in that work and uh, also graciously uh, you know, transcending time zones. Really appreciative of everyone doing their check-ins in the chat today and all the places we have people coming to us from. Um, awesome to see this, uh, this global presence. Uh, we're also joined by Isha Narola. Um, Isha is currently a doctoral student at the Harvard School of Public Health. Uh, before joining Harvard, she was the community health director at Possible Health. Um, she's also worked as a senior technical advisor for the Carter Center in South Sudan, where she managed part of their guinea worm eradication program. Um, she has also contributed to a number of fact-finding missions for the Human Rights, for the Human Rights Law Network's Reproductive Rights Unit. Uh, served as a Peace Corps volunteer um, and a health advocate in Baltimore City. Um, Isha, so uh, so grateful for you for being here for, with us today. Thank you so much, Steve. Awesome. Um, so, you know, I provided a quick introduction to each of you, but um, I'm really curious um, to hear a little bit more about this extensive expertise you all have in this space. Um, so could you talk a little bit um, in more depth about your work and kind of what brings you to this conversation today? Um, and Benita, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to start with you. Thank you, Steve. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank uh, to OSU for organizing this excellent uh, series of talk and I'm uh, really glad to be here. And uh, for uh, those who don't know, I'm currently in Nepal, but uh, my workplace uh, is actually based in the um, United States. And I've been working based out of India since the past couple of years. Uh, Health Foundation Nepal is an organization that I lead, um, which is really a community of Nepali uh, health workers who lives in the U.S. diaspora. And we've been leading a lot of community health work in, in rural Nepal since, it, since its inception in 2013. And in the COVID crisis, uh, more recently, we've been working on um, providing and supporting the health system to, to extend the healthcare gap that exists especially among the home isolated patient through our telemedicine work. 
and um, uh, and we've also been providing some uh, mental health uh, psychosocial counseling support to the COVID-19 affected families all over Nepal. And, and beyond that, uh, during this crisis, Health Foundation Nepal has also been working on uh, expanding the testing gap that currently exists in the country and strengthening the public health measures um, so to, that actually is needed to, to contain the transmission of virus, such as tracing and isolation and so forth. Uh, so in, in through these experiences, what we've been really working on is actually to reduce the burden on the health system um, uh, due to the COVID-19 crisis that's going on. And, and from these experiences, what we've identified is that really like this, the cycle is endless unless we contain the virus, unless we provide and vaccinate all the people who are eligible, the virus will continue to spread. And because Nepal is so weak in its public health measures, vaccine is, is most urgently needed in, in, in Nepal. And I've been doing the advocacy work regarding vaccine through my workplace, that is at Johns Hopkins University. And also the colleagues at Health Foundation Nepal have been working through their different workplaces who are based in different United uh, States universities and um, health um, care organization and advocating their own leaders within their organization to, uh, to prioritize uh, Nepal and release public statement related to you know, Nepal's need for vaccine. Awesome, thank you so much, Benita. Uh, Isha, can you give us a little bit of context about you and your work and your entry to the space? Sure, sure. Um, as you already mentioned, um, I worked in far western Nepal for over three years um, on health system strengthening and specifically with, which I'll discuss a little bit later on in the, in the panel today, um, with the community health workers, the female community health volunteers in Nepal. Um, I also bring my experience in disease elimination and outbreak response, both my work with guinea worm in South Sudan, um, but also most recent, more recently um, on malaria elimination efforts across the Asia Pacific. Um, and as a diasporic uh, Nepali and an American, I've been engaged in advocacy efforts here stateside um, through Harvard University, the School of Public Health, um, and I'm excited to be here to um, call other diasporic Nepalis and other Americans in general um, to stay engaged with what's going on, um, ensure the Nepal crisis is on the minds of America, Americans, and um, to share my uh, knowledge of the Nepali healthcare system and my previous experience of outbreak response to deepen this discussion, which I hope to do today. So thank you so much for organizing this and I'm glad to be here with you all. Awesome, thank you so much, Isha. You know, the, this piece to me about like staying engaged, I think is one of the really critical interventions that I think people can make. You know, when, when we talk about, um, talk about advocacy around these issues, um, I think that like, you know, we want, we would like to see something happen, happen immediately and like everyone that wants a vaccine can get one tomorrow, but um, this is a long term engagement um, that I think we, and, and hopefully this, this time can use to, um, to get people down the funnel to, to connect with organizations like yours doing the work. Um, so with that, you know, we've, we've talked a little bit about um, we talked a little bit about kind of this, the situation like Dr. Malik who provided this, this overview and both of you have talked about your work. Um, so I'm curious though, if you can just give us a little bit more of an on the ground perspective, like what is happening in Nepal and, and what is the signal for the future of global COVID recovery? So if I may start, um, for those who don't know, Nepal shares very long, about 800, 1800 kilometers of uh, border with India. And when the crisis started in India and Indian cities, um, in Mumbai and, and, and in Delhi, Nepal was just two weeks behind the crisis. And the international media might not have done enough coverage of what is happening in Nepal, but Nepal is in crisis. And we are reporting about 4,500, 4, 4,600 uh, cases per day um, and 100 deaths per day. And that's a decline from what was happening just uh, in the middle of May, we were reporting up to 9,000 cases uh, on the month of May and, and up to 250 deaths per day, 
all the deaths that happened throughout this pandemic has been like most of them happened in a single month of May of this year. And in, 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 in all this crisis, the, the Nepal is reporting the highest transmission rate in the entire world. And what is being uh, like reported is more than like about 50% of those who are tested are coming out positive with COVID-19 virus, which really means that the number of tests that we are doing is not enough. So we really don't know the true scale of the epidemic that is within this country. And because of this surge, uh, the hospital system, the healthcare system that Nepal has, which is already weak, has been greatly overwhelmed. And the healthcare system hasn't been able to respond to the patient who are appearing in the, who are coming to the emergency room, requiring oxygen and respiratory support. Large hospital have had to turn down patient because of the lack of oxygen and vital resources. And the dependence of Nepal, because it's a landlocked country with India, has and the India's restriction on export of some of these critical resources that Nepal needs has been a true bottleneck in Nepal's case. And, and what has been the case is Nepal has been on a lockdown since about a month, more than a month now. It's we are into fifth week and we are still reporting very high positivity. And we haven't been able to expand the testing capacity to really know, you know the true scale of the epidemic. The cities are now reporting lesser cases, but the villages are now you know, reporting higher number of cases. And we don't know the true data on villages because you know, there's no testing happening, but there are news reports that says that the entire village is actually sick with very COVID-like symptoms, and there is no way to actually you know if it's COVID or not. Um, and just to add to that, um, so Nepal plans to vaccinate about 22 million people out of its 29 million population. And it's important to keep in mind that 28% of the population is under 14, which means they would not have access to the vaccine currently, at least until um, that testing is done. Now, for those of you in the states where we're seeing um, some states having upwards of 70% of the state population having received at least one vaccination, and I think the country has reached that as well, as we see the country reopening here in the U.S., it's important to keep in mind that only 2.4% of the people in Nepal have received two doses. Uh, roughly 7% have received one dose. Now, these inoculation efforts uh, started back in January earlier this year, um, and Nepal purchased 2 million vaccines, vaccine doses from the Serum, Serum Institute in India, of which 1 million doses have been delivered so far. But the Serum Institute, in the wake of the deadly COVID surge in India, the Serum Institute has released a statement saying that they will only start delivering the remaining order in late 2021, which puts Nepal in a really uh, precarious situation, um, given that they were reliant on those resources. So when we think about the landscape of donations currently, um, China has donated, China, India, and COVAX. That's where Nepal is relying on um, th their, their vaccine resources, their vaccine supplies. Um, and now we heard yesterday from the White House, as, as Arati uh, mentioned earlier, that they'll be donating 25 million do do doses of the vaccine, 75% through COVAX and 25% through bilateral donations. Now, 7 million of that 25 have been set aside for 16 countries and territories um, across South and Southeast Asia, of which Nepal was included. So advocacy efforts that have happened prior to this point, I do feel uh, hopeful have contributed to the fact that Nepal has been included on this list of 16 uh, across South and Southeast Asia, across Asia, but it's still not enough. The concern about COVAX is that over the past year, since uh, for those of you guys who don't know COVAX, it's a WHO, a UN backed um, uh, collaborative uh, to, to, uh, that is aimed at 
achieving equitable di distribution of vaccines, particularly focused on low and middle income countries. But the concern that has been raised about COVAX is the method in which they use for equitable distribution. And what's been highlighted is that they've been using a population-based model, meaning that countries of the same population will get the same number of vaccines. Now, the problem with this type of model is that it doesn't distinguish countries that are currently going through an outbreak or are having a surge in cases like Nepal compared to countries that aren't. So for example, Ghana is of a, a similar population of Nepal, but Ghana has significantly less cases over the last two weeks have not been dealing with the rise in cases that Nepal is seeing. So even just based off my own experience on outbreak response and disease elimination and eradication, countries that are actively going through an outbreak must be prioritized. And that should be included in the way uh, vaccine distribution is calculated. So we'll have to see over the next few days, we don't know how many vaccines will be allocated to Nepal, but we'll have to see over the next few days uh, what that number is, and if COVAX is changing their approach to how they distribute vaccines. Thanks for that, Isha. You know, um, I appreciate the the piece that like the advocacy efforts out there are working and are making a difference. But um, you know, really putting a pin on some of the um the unique challenges and difficulties happening happening here, and like and how things are being allocated, and just the the reality is that like we we need like more, and you know, this point about like sharing is going to be the way that gets us out of this. Um, you know, I also, I appreciate you, what you brought up about, you know, um, individual like states, like in, you know, here in the United States, like there, there's great variability between different states. And, um, you know, here in my home state of Ohio, we are actively giving away a million dollars to five people to try and get the vaccine. So, um, you know, so much of, for, for people here in the U.S., like so much of, um, of COVID has really like looked like a localized phenomenon, you know, like. Um, I have friends in Texas who, you know, they've said that their state has been open for months and, you know, here in Ohio has looked a little bit different. So um, given the way that it's kind of been localized to here or people's perception has been localized, um, can you all talk a bit about like kind of the global implications? You know, you've said like why Nepal has an acute need right now, but what are some of the global implications of us not addressing that need in a way that matches um, the demand right now? Um, one thing that, you know, the Ebola uh, epidemic or the MERS epidemic that, you know, the world faced only a couple of years ago have uh, taught the world is that the epidemic in any country can be a global threat, given how connected the world is today. And Dr. Malik, who already said in the beginning, no one is safe until we all are safe. So look at Vietnam. Vietnam had very, very effective control of the first wave of COVID. It was a global example, reporting only 35 deaths and 1,500 cases. But now it's reporting a surge of second wave and with you know 500 cases per day. Look at India, the place where I actually work and also was involved in some of the reporting of the first wave. Uh, the world was lauding India's effort uh, for, for managing it very effectively until late February and mid-March. Come late March and April, India was reporting 400,000 cases per day and the number of that total that's doubled within just two months. And, and the number of that is being reported is also considered to be hugely underreported. So what, what, what this all says is that, you know, the, the virus that is existing in any given part of the world is a threat because the nature of these virus is that it mutates and it could mutate into a very you know, deadlier version. And this is what happened in India. The Delta variant that, that circulated in Nepal actually you know, originated in India. And it, it was such a highly transmissible version that you know, Nepal went into this deep, crisis. And, and there are already reports, um, and it is uh, although unofficial, um, you know, Bertis Tablet until yesterday was reporting that there is a Nepal variant, quote unquote. And what is what is being reported by scientists, and, and this is just the data that is that has come out in last two days, is there is a 
there has been um, a mutation that a spike mutation that has been identified in a Delta variant that was circulating in Nepal and in India. And this uh, spike mutation that has now appeared and has been identified in people who had a travel history with Nepal in past couple of days, it was, was the same mutation that actually uh, was seen in the variant that was circulating in South Africa and that actually, you know, uh, weakened the vaccine efficacy. Uh, that was the, that has the evidence that has been reported. So scientists are concerned and countries are concerned. So as long as there is virus and as long as there is highly transmissible variant that is circulating in any given country of the world, there is still a threat. So the situation in Nepal does have global implications. Um, thanks so much for that, Benita. You know, when um, I think like to, you know, this obviously is something that like is easy to ignore for for people, especially that are that are stateside, may not like see the direct linkages. Um, but I'm appreciating like some of these things I'm seeing in the chat from people who, you know, like these linkages like are are everywhere. Um, you know, when to kind of shift back to Nepal, um, you know, there. There are obviously like significant challenges like in the COVID response that that the country is facing. We've mentioned like the bottlenecks um, with the uh, with vaccine distribution. Um, but based on um, the experience that both of you have, um, you know, what are some of the unique assets um, that are present in the country? Um, you know, that um, that health workers or or others that are doing that work locally can leverage um, in order to uh, to overcome some of the challenges that we're seeing. Um. So as, as Benita had mentioned earlier, I mean, ne Nepal is, you know, being crushed under the pressure of this current crisis in an already weak uh, healthcare system. However, there are certain strengths to the layout of Nepal's healthcare infrastructure, their public healthcare infrastructure. Um, current, Nepal has a decentralized model. So there is a health strengthening capacity within Nepal to decentralize um, vaccines, which I know is a, a concern that COVAX has raised given some of their lessons learned over the past year, which is, which is different. This is different from other countries where Nepal actually has a healthcare infrastructure that can decentralize that can um, that is decentralized so that uh, vaccine can reach populations even in some of the most remote in some of the most remote areas. Um, there is the way that the model works is there are district hospitals um, and primary health care centers and then further decentralized for uh, basic primary care at health posts and outreach clinics. And there's also a cadre of female community health volunteers in Nepal. And this, which have been working in conjunction with the decentralized healthcare system have been very effective in raising child vaccination rates, mass drug distribution across the country, um, and has improved access to care over the years. So for example, um, child immunization rate, it was reported in 2016, was about 78%. So this underscores the country's ability to reach targeted populations, even in remote areas. So if we think about herd immunity being 70%, um, the country's track record with vaccines and mass drug administrations exemplify their ability to achieve this if resources are available. Um, I, I mentioned the FCHV program. That's the Female Community Health Volunteer Program that was started in 1988 to reduce the high rates of maternal mortality that plagued the country at that time. So at that time, maternal mortality was 900, about 900, 901 uh, per 100,000. And uh, as reported just a few years ago, it's less than 200 per 100,000. And the FCHVs, have been credited to have helped um, contribute to, to uh, these lowered, uh, these reduced maternal mortality rates. Um, so I think that Nepali health workers can work within these decentralized, within this decentralized care structure, use their experience, especially their efforts to inoculate um, large percentages of children um, to do that for the general population. And 
Uh, all this to say is that like we're seeing in the US, health disparities do exist. So I'm not trying to make things all super rosy. I think that um, efforts will need to be made over time to address the health disparities based in, in Nepal based on SES, caste, geographical barriers, in addition to many others, to ensure vulnerable populations do not fall behind. But this public health infrastructure can be leveraged. And, and I, I, the last point I wanna make is that I think that creates a big incentive. Like I I was reading how um, using that population-based model, Co COVAX sent uh, a large number of vaccines out to South Sudan. I've worked in South Sudan as well, in some of the most remote parts of South Sudan. I know firsthand, living there three and a half years, that they do not have that basic decentralized uh, infrastructure. And 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 we. I was not surprised to read that so many vaccines, thousands of vaccines were wasted in South Sudan uh, because of that. But given my experience working in uh, rural Nepal in the far west, um, I do think it's a different situation. And that coupled with the, the rise in cases um, provides a strong case for why vaccines can and should be prioritized for Nepal. Excellent. Thanks so much for that, Isha. Um, you know, so I, I want to transition us a little bit now to like this advocacy piece and like how how people can get engaged in a WIAM. We have a really great turnout today. We have like 135 people in our room right now. Um, but I can, um, I'm gonna make an assumption that like some people who are listening in today may be like struggling to understand like their their entry point to the work. You know, if they, um, you both obviously have, have very long track records of like doing this work like all around the world. Um, but so can you tell us the story about like kind of how you, um how you got connected or like how you, um, started getting engaged in this kind of like these public health interventions and and um, especially like the vaccine equity work um, and maybe tell a story that can help illustrate how someone here who's struggling to find their entry point can start to get involved. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, for me, the entry point was really my background, my background as a nurse, my background as a public health professional and my current workplace at Johns Hopkins School of Public Health. Um, and my, my ongoing work on health system strengthening work really, you know, allowed me to understand what, uh, you know, the, the gaps are in countries like Nepal, where I'm originally from. And, and in, in doing the work that the Health Foundation Nepal has actually led during this crisis of actually trying to take care of the patient who has actually been already been infected and are really facing the brunt because the you know, the health system cannot take care of them, sort of realize that, you know, vaccine is the only thing that works. And, and our affiliation uh, through the, uh, you know, university, what we were able to do is we were like a, a bunch of Nepali colleagues and students were able to organize ourselves and actually put out a letter through our dean at School of Public Health. And that also orders to call the action to for all the people who are hearing and reading about Nepal to donate to frontline healthcare organization to raise voice regarding the you know the need for Nepal's vaccine and and that's that's where we started and 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 knowing the fact and knowing what's going on is really the starting point of what we can do next you should do you have um, potentially a, a starting point that that got you into this work well, I mean, as I mentioned before, I, I, I've been in public health for more years than I, I care to share on this thing, on this call, but, but um, I, I, you know, it's, 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 it's it's both because of my experience in outbreak response, my passion doing that work in outbreak response and disease elimination, coupled with my experience in Nepal, and also as my identity as a diasporic Nepali American. So I think all of these combined was pulled me to, to kind of step into this, starting with my own university, but then also partnering with other members of the diaspora community and my friends and loved ones in Nepal to do whatever we can 
to push for more attention. Now, Nepal, um, I, I identify as a global citizen in many ways. I've worked in many other countries as well. But um, ne what I've seen is that Nepal, uh, because India is also going through this crisis and Nepal shares open borders with India, um, it's been um, overshadowed. Uh, India's crisis has overshadowed what's going on in Nepal, but with its own distinct government, it needs a, its own distinct efforts. And so um, that's part of what has kind of pulled me um, pulled me into this work. Awesome. You, you know, I am, um, I love both of these responses. Um, you know, like Benita's point about like, she, um, she like found her, her colleagues and other students and they like, they, they got their people organized and they contacted the Dean and, and Isha, you know, like really like centering, centering self and like unique stories. Um, I think it's something that we're really like, that it, that can apply to everyone, regardless of where we're at. You know, um, if you are like formally connected to the, to the health system or not, like, um, you know, that if you're here in this room, you probably have a personal story that has drawn you to this. And it's something that you can find your folks and get organized um, and, and lift up some of those stories. Um, so with that, you know, you, you did mention how it, like y'all are connected to organizations and um, we have organizational sponsors here and um, people continue to, to, to um, lift up like some of the, the direct service organizations that they're affiliated with in the chat. Um, so can you tell us about like who is doing global vaccine efficacy work right now? And, um, you know, like how can people support the work of organizations that are currently engaged in this? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll take a step back and, and help us remember like this definition of vaccine apartheid, which, which, which is the, the title of this session today. And, um, our discussion, the focus of our discussion, which is that it's referring to wealthy nations getting uh, or wealthier groups getting vaccines while, while others do not. And as you had mentioned before, Steve, um, the solution is more sharing. So I think with keeping that in mind, taking a step back uh, as an American, as a Nepali American, I think um, there's a lot Americans can do, even though we are not on the front lines, to push our own government for uh, vaccine in the in this fight for vaccine equity. And um, I believe, uh, Steve, we've compiled some resources that we'll share with the attendees. So I would encourage all of you to um, dive into some of those resources that we're going to share, um, work that, um, and, and reach out to your representatives and we'll provide some of those resources. The, some other things that I just kind of wanna keep on all of your guys' radar is um, some of the challenges that Nepal is facing and uh, where we can help. So small nations like Nepal, they're not able to utilize the TRIPS waiver, which is a, a, WT, a, a, yeah, a WTO agreement, World Trade Organization agreement on uh, trade related aspects of intellectual property rights um, because they're afraid of repercussions like trade sanctions. So we can call on our US government to support such moves of countries so that they can produce their own vaccines by not imposing trade sanctions um, and we can also call on big pharmas to share their intellectual properties to CTAP or provide voluntary licenses to provide more vaccine production companies. For those of you who don't know, CTAP is a COVID technology access pool. Um, it's part of the access to COVID tools accelerator that pools technology and know-how to make it universally available. And that's led by the WHO. Um, so I, I, I think that, uh, you know, there's, we've compiled some resources on um, how to reach out to um, the Senate South Asian subcommittee um, so that Nepal stays on their radar. Again, um, as I mentioned before, uh, sadly, Nepal is often eclipsed by what's going on in India. India is the, I don't know, what is it? The 8,000 pound gorilla. <laughs> 
and um, and we certainly care about the the crisis there. We share board Nepal shares borders with India, but so I think that calling specifically on the Senate um, subcommittee members um, and ensuring that Nepal is on their radar and they are fully aware of what the current what the the current crisis going on in Nepal and uh, the need for vaccines. Um, I think it helped even, I think it helped with getting Nepal on that list of 16 countries and territories, but I think more needs to be done. We need more vaccines than the 7 million that's gonna be distributed across the 16. So um, those are some of the things that come to mind off the top of my head for those of you guys based stateside. A couple of things I would add uh, is, is that when we are reaching out to our representative or to any, any government uh, folks in, in the United States, what we can really do is actually make an economic case for this vaccine, sharing the vaccine. The, the report, the policy brief that has been released by IMF has, has done the calculation and then they found that the $50, like 50 billion investment today on vaccines production can actually generate about $9 trillion of economic growth by 2025. And that is because we will be controlling the pandemic and the losses that might be incurred because of the pandemic. So we can really make a, a really easily make an economic case for equitable vaccine deployment and production when we are actually calling on our government. And, and what I would also say is that vaccine, the world needs to prioritize vaccine equity because lives and humanity is at stake. You know, the, the, the modeling that has been done by uh, Northeastern University has, has indicated that, you know, the first 2 billion doses that has been rolled out throughout the world, if it was proportionally uh, distributed throughout the world, you know, the world death would have fallen by 61%, you know, and that hasn't been the case. And, and, and when countries like Nepal uh, when it goes into lockdown for like months into, you know, and, and that has been the case for COVID-19 and also in the first wave is that there are other things that are happening. Young girls are getting married off early. There are increased cases of gender-based violence. You know, pregnant women aren't able to go and deliver babies at the, at the institutional health facilities. And last year there was a study done where, um, you know, 50%, uh, there was a decrease in institutional birth rate by 50%. Isha had cited that Nepal has done an awesome job of reducing the maternal mortality because of the FCSB, the frontline, uh, the healthcare volunteers. But, you know, this is at risk because we are continuing to have the lockdown. And, and you know, and, and for a country like Nepal, about 15% of people survive in less than $2 per day. And these people are at a risk of further impoverishment if this crisis continues. And not to say, I mean, health system is already on the brink of collapse. So there is humanity at stake. When we call on our representative, when we call on our people, we can, you, we can cite these sources. We can cite that these are the real issues that people are facing. Thank you both so much for that. Um, and so, Ed, as Isha mentioned, um, you know, I have, um, I do have some resources that that I want to share. And I want, I want to come back to this piece about like, you know, continuing to to stay engaged and deepen our engagement in this area. Um, so, what we're going to do in the, um, the next five minutes is actually um, take a bit of an advocacy break. Um, so, some and what I would encourage you to do over the next five minutes here is. Um, I've got this slide up here that has examples of some organizations that um, are actively engaged in this work and that have calls to action um, that that you can take. So, um, so notably, um, Nepal Rising is one of the sponsors of this event. Um, has has been really active um, around um, some of these hearings happening in the Senate and upcoming hearings in um, in the U.S. House, like specifically um, on these issues. So. Um, you know, thinking about deepening our engagement, connecting with organizations that are doing the work. So you don't have to come away from this session specifically with all of your to-do lists, but getting plugged into the network of folks that are doing this work actively. Um, there's also been a ton of stuff shared in the chat over the course of our conversation thus far. So I would encourage you to, um, to take a look at some of these orgs that are doing work. Um, 
see what people put in the chat. And if you have other resources or calls to action, um, go ahead and add those now so that we can get a sense of, of the things that we can be plugging into at this moment. Um, so with that, we're going to, um, I'm gonna give you all five minutes. Actually, I'm gonna, I'll leave this slide up here. I'm going to, um, to, to put on some music and we'll, we'll come back um, at 11.50 to kind of get some closing thoughts and wrap up. But hopefully you can use this time to, um, for each of you to get a sense of your plan for next steps that you're looking to take. All right, well, I hope that folks were able to, to use that time to, to find something for, um, for your next steps. Like in, in my work specifically around doing advocacy training here in the College of Social Work, this, um, this question about like, what do I do is probably one of the most persistent ones that I, um, that I try and answer um, in, in collaboration with my colleagues here. Um, so with, um, you know, we're getting close to the end of our time here. Um, there have been 
a lot of people um, talking in the chat about like some of the, the unique challenges that exist. You know, um, we I see some things about like the um, the difficulties with COVAX, this piece about the TRIPS waiver, um, you know, all of these different like sites and possibilities for intervention. Um, so, so Benita, Isha, um, I'm wondering if you have any kind of um, closing thoughts or or direction that you would like to leave people with as we wrap up today, given the you know the wide scale of this problem and all the different um, uh, potential places to intervene and plug into the work. Sure, I can just share a few final thoughts. I think that um, while there's so much more to discuss, I think what we hope we were able to get across is that uh, vaccine inequity is a huge issue. So it's not just a moral issue as, as Benita had shared earlier, it's an economic issue. I mean, we are a global society that is very connected um, and it's a threat to uh, the entire world. So we need to address this inequity. We need to urge our governments and policymakers in the US and in other high income countries to donate money, uh, to donate vaccines and other technologies to make vaccines and, and supplies as well. Um, because as we've mentioned several times, no one's safe until everyone's safe. So I will leave you with those final thoughts. Um, what I would say at the end is like, you know, WHO's director general has said that, you know, the 75% of vaccine that has been administered thus far has only gone to 10 countries so far. And, and what really speaks is this, you know, the, the kind of inequity that actually exists on vaccines. And, and we cannot be distracted by the agendas of protectionism or vaccine nationalism. Because you know that's what every country is trying to do right now, and that is also you know affecting and preventing the most vulnerable people in countries, low-income country, where eighty-four percent of the world population actually, you know, like lives um, from from getting the vaccine. You know, Canada has bought five times more vaccine than it needs. United States, UK, Australia, all these countries have bought like vaccine that you know two times more than they need. U.S. has, you know, donated 80 million vaccine, which is a very welcome move. If they have 300 million extra vaccine, then 80 million is nothing. You know, there is still room for us to do more advocacy. There is still room for us, uh, for United States to actually contribute to the COVAX such that there is, you know, more countries that are eligible to receive vaccine can actually receive them. So our work is not done until we ensure that all the countries like Nepal actually have vulnerable population that are covered with vaccine and we need to continue doing the advocacy until that happens. And to do that high income country, especially the United States has a huge role to play. It has been a global leader in all of these things. And, and we can continue to um, you know, raise our voices, call the representative and urge the big pharma or even companies to, you know, to share their knowledge. And um, that's all I want to say. Thank you. Excellent. Th um, thank you so much, um, uh, um, Isha and Benita, for for sharing like all of your expertise and um, you know all of this wonderful guidance. Um, it's it, it's really amazing to um, to to be around your work and hear about the things that you're doing um, to to address this global issue. Um, I'm also just like really struck by the amount of resources people have put in the chat over the course of this hour here. Um, somebody mentioned a little ways up that you know you do have the ability to um, to save the chat. Uh, so if you saw something here or you want to kind of like catch up on the, the conversation that happened, um, you can just uh, you can uh, click the little three buttons down by your chat box and save the chat. Um, we will be sharing the recording of this afterward uh, so people can have access to the resources. Um, but with that, I'm going to um, to pass it back to uh, uh, to Dr. Artie Malik who uh, to give us some closing comments um, and uh, and tell us about some other events that are coming up in this series that we're having about vaccine apartheid. Thank you. This was great. I was just very enthused to see all this continuous interaction from everybody. And thank you to our panelists and of course our moderator. Um, thank you everyone for joining today. Um, as we have learned, our voices matter. Um, and ending this pandemic will take a global effort. And uh, we really hope you will remain engaged to really highlight this um, growing global vaccine inequity. 
um, that as we said before, no one is safe until we all are. And we will uh, please note that we'll be bringing a second session on this global series, which is going to be focused on Kenya and the African region, which is tentatively scheduled for June 25th. So please stay tuned, um, learn more about this issue, um, get engaged, talk to your friends, talk to your family, everything matters, right? All of these engagements matter. And so um, with that, let's continue to channel our positive energies and our advocacy efforts to really heal the world and note that our voices matter. Thank you so much, everyone. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Maleku. Um, the, the final thing that I will leave you all with is um, we did have a um, we do have an evaluation uh, for this session. So uh, please do give us your feedback on what you saw today. Um, the uh, we will be continuing this conversation, as, as Dr. Malik, who said, with a um, with a focus on um, on Kenya on June 25th. Um, the the link for that will be forthcoming. Uh, so please like complete that evaluation survey so that we can make sure to capture your information and have you um, and, and stay in touch with you about um, upcoming events. Um, but with that, um, we will be hanging out in the room for for just a couple more moments uh, for folks to um, to put in any other resources in the chat that they want. Um, but we so appreciate you all uh, being here with us, um, and we hope to see you again uh, in the near future. Thank you. Those still in the room, I put the evaluation survey in here one last time. Um, thank you all for being part of this. Um, thank you, Isha, Benita, um, Marty, Jerry. Really like a great honor to be able to do this with you all. Um, and with that, I'm going to be closing the meeting. Thank you. Okay.